Please be seated. Our second scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 22 to 30. Hear now for the word of the Lord. It was the feast of the dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered round him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me. But you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks for the opportunity to listen for your word. And Lord, I ask this morning that either because of me or in spite of me, that you bring a message to your people. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. We know these words. We know them very well. And one of the things that I was very um, thankful for when I first came to Epworth is the artistry that we have on display here in the church. I don't know if you've noticed, I think many of you have, but maybe you haven't. The Lord is my shepherd is something that's pronounced in the stained glass window. We have the shepherd with the lamb across his back. Up here on the uh, altar, carved out in wood, is the shepherd with the sheep. And if you look closely, he's holding a sheep. These are awesome visual reminders to us that the Lord is our shepherd. <clears throat> and one story that I remember very distinctly uh, that Pastor Kim, who was with us before, shared after she came back from her trip to the Holy Land, she had the opportunity to meet with and talk with a shepherd and learn something about, especially that stained glass window up there where the, the sheep is across the shepherd's back. He said, sometimes when the sheep get really unruly, and don't stay with the shepherd, that sometimes they have to break the legs of the sheep and then reset the legs, and then the shepherd will carry the sheep around for weeks while the sheep heals. And in the process of that time, a love and a bond grows between that sheep and that shepherd. And then after that, once the sheep is healed, um, that that sheep stays close by. I'm not sure that I necessarily want to recommend that across the board for uh, the ways that we interact with or whatever, but it just brought something new to mind for that, that, you know, in that, this shepherd is caring for that sheep for a period of time until it's able to walk on its own and loving and caring and a bond is forming in the midst of that. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The other thing I thought about this week is the John passage talks about the sheep know the shepherd's voice. The sheep know the voice of Jesus in their life. And for whatever reason, it brought to mind uh, a memory from my childhood how many of you had parents who had a very special way of calling you in at night when it was time to come home? Anybody? Okay. How many of your parents whistled? All right, a couple. How about bells? Bells? Okay, very good. Any other ways that your parents called you in? Yelling. What was yours? Blink the lights. Oh, I was too far away for that. Oh. <laughs> so... 
Um, my grandfather was a cadence caller in the Army National Guard. My father had been a cadence caller for the Marine Corps. So every kid in the neighborhood knew my father's voice. And no one could miss it whatsoever. If you noticed, all the Jones men are pretty quiet people. But we heard, we heard those voices. And when my dad called, it was like everything in the entire neighborhood stopped. And people turned and looked at me and said, Bill, your dad's calling. You got to get home. But, you know, it was a very distinct call and a very distinct voice. And I could be blocks away and I would hear my dad call. And, you know, in the midst of that, I knew that it was time to go home. I knew my father's voice. And I also knew what would happen if I didn't get home right away. Uh, but I knew my dad's voice. And one thing that I did learn from that very much was the importance of children knowing the voice of their parents, knowing the voice of their parents. So one thing I remember very distinctly uh, when Pam and I uh, first were pregnant with Nathan and then again uh, with Joelle was trying to make our voices known to our children even before they were out in the open with us. Uh, so speaking to the tummy. It may have looked weird or strange or whatever, but with Nathan, it was just speaking to the tummy. But when Joel came along, I found something really cool. They had these speakers that you could put on both sides of the tummy and a microphone. I thought, man, this is great technology. I love it. And we would tell stories and talk and everything else. And each night we would get together and we'd read and we'd pray together. So Nathan would come in and join us and we'd have the speakers on mommy's tummy, and we'd tell stories, and we'd say prayers and everything else. But the importance was for our children to know the voice of their father, their mother. And for Nathan, he had the opportunity to do that with his sister, and he would talk to her every night. Uh, and what an amazing thing that is. So when I hear the Lord is my shepherd, those are some of the things that come to mind. Knowing the voice of the one that loves you. The first passage from our responsive reading, I want to read that to you again. I know that we know it from funerals and all sorts of stuff, but I really want us to listen to the words because it tells you exactly the love of God. The Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What comforting words. How many times do we go through stuff in life and we forget that we have a shepherd who loves us? that walks with us, that wants to lead us beside the still waters, wants to restore our soul. That's what God offers. That's what Psalm 23 reminds us of. And we have to remember that in those times that we are not alone, that God is with us. So what does it mean when we say, the Lord is my shepherd? Well, I think the first part is, the Lord is my shepherd is a declaration of our dependence on God. Sheep are dependent upon their shepherd for safety, for security, for food, and everything else. The Lord is my shepherd is a declaration on our part that we are dependent on God for love. We are dependent on God for forgiveness. We are dependent on God for grace. We are dependent on God for salvation. That each and every one of these things are an important part of what we need to fill our spirits and our lives and make it be everything that God hopes for us to have. The Lord is my shepherd is also a statement of ownership. It's a reminder that we are God's created ones. 
that God made us, that God loves us and embraces us, that we are God's children. The Lord is my shepherd is an acknowledgement of a personal relationship with Christ. It's an acknowledgement that we accept Christ as our shepherd, that we know that we have a shepherd who loves us, that the Lord is our shepherd. So the questions that we have to ask ourselves today are two. Is Jesus our shepherd? And do we know his voice? So let's take a look at that first question. Is Jesus our shepherd? Do we depend on God for everything? When we're going through a rough patch in life, when we're going through a difficult time, is our first response to drop to our knees and call on God to be there for us? Or do we strap on the Superman sticker and throw it on our chest and try and do it ourselves? That is something I wrestle with all the time. My first response should be dropping to my knees, but typically my first response is, I'll fix it. I'll make it better. You know, if God is my shepherd, I need to accept the fact that I need to go to God first. And if God empowers me to then go and fix it, great. But I need God's design for that situation first. I need to be obedient to what the shepherd is asking me to do. But we all need to wrestle with that. Do we depend on God for everything? Do we recognize that we are all God's children and disciples? Do we remember that? Regardless of what we look like, regardless of where we live, regardless of the size of the house we have, the money in our bank account, or anything else, do we recognize that every single one of us, whoever we are, whatever situation we're in, that we are all God's children and disciples? Sometimes I think we worry about what the other sheep in our herd look like or act like. Do I want to be in that herd? Do I want to be with that shepherd? God loves all of us. We're all equal in God's eyes. God's the shepherd and decides who's in his herd. Do we recognize that we are all God's children and disciples? Do we have a personal relationship with Christ that allows us to know God's word and voice in our lives? Are we so close in our relationship with God that we know when God has spoken to us? It might not, obviously, it's not always going to be a cloud coming down and lightning booming and calling you out from the cloud. Maybe it's going to be a feeling or something that you read that stands out to you or, or words that you hear in your mind that guide you and lead you. But is your relationship with Christ close enough that you know that word, that you know the voice of your shepherd. If we examine the Easter story and how Jesus' disciples respond to a resurrected Christ, we see a glimpse of what it looks like to be one of his sheep. Mary goes to the tomb in the morning, and she gets there and finds that the tomb is empty. Mary knew it was Jesus, though, when she heard him call her name, when Jesus said, Mary. She knew exactly who it was in that moment. Then we have the two on the road to Emmaus who were distraught. They're, they're devastated that Christ has died on the cross. And Christ comes and walks with them and teaches them and guides them and goes along the way. And they invite him to dinner. And it is not until he takes the bread and breaks it that they recognize him. But in that moment, they recognized and they said, weren't our hearts burning within us when he shared the scripture with us on the way. They recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Then we had Peter with the disciples out on his boat. And they're catching nothing. <laughs> and this stranger comes along on the seashore. We heard this story last week and on Sunday and says, hey, throw your nets on the other side. And they do so, and the catch is so big that it's about to capsize the boat. And Peter recognizes that it's the shepherd, it's Jesus, and he jumps into the water and he swims to shore because he realized that only Jesus could have granted that kind of catch. You see, each of them were yearning for their shepherd. After Easter, they were yearning for their shepherd. 
And each one of them knew his voice, they knew his actions, and they knew his presence. They had a close enough relationship with him that they knew who Jesus was, even if he didn't quite look the same. They knew the voice. They knew the actions. They knew his presence. So how do we get there? How do we accept him as shepherd and know his voice in our lives? In our scripture from today, we recognize uh, that Jesus is telling the, the Jewish leaders at the time that it's important to be in close relationship and to know the voice of Jesus, that those that know his voice will have eternal life. Those who know his voice will have his love and protection and comfort and everything else. But let them know that they were outside of that. They were looking for miracles. They were looking for actions and things like that. And Jesus was showing them, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And I think sometimes we do that to Jesus too. We want unrealistic things because we're not willing to look at what Christ is already doing in our lives. So how do we gain that understanding? How do we gain that trust? How do we come to know that Jesus is our shepherd? Well, the first thing we have to do is read and study God's word. There was a pastor at a church that I served a while ago that did a sermon one Sunday that was kind of, kind of tricky. Um, but he asked the congregation, he's like, okay, think of your Bible at your house. How many of you could write your name in it? And he was talking about the dust that had formed possibly on the Bibles at their house and said, how many of you could write your name in it? And you could just hear people, oh my gosh, and turning in their, their pews and stuff like that. But the question is, when is the last time you picked up your Bible and read it? It's one thing to come to worship. If worshiping is very important and listening for wonderful speakers to get up and share the word with you from scripture is great. But it can't be the only thing. You have to dig in and know the word for yourself. You need to get into a relationship with your Bible so that you come to hear God's voice through your own reading. It's important to read and study God's word. And there's ways that we can do that through Bible study, through worship, through many other things. But those are vital and important things. If you want to know the shepherd's voice, you have to come into relationship with the voice of the shepherd. And that's one of those ways. The other thing we have that our confirmation class knows is PPGSW, or prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness, are those specific things that we covenant to, that we, we share whenever we're doing, doing a baptism or a confirmation or anything else. We covenant as members of the church to pray. So we need to read scripture. We need to pray. Be praying for other people in our congregation. Be praying for our loved ones. Be praying for our neighbors. Be praying for our nation. Be praying for the world. Because when you pray, you're in conversation with God about something deep on your heart. You want to hear God's voice. You got to talk back. God's willing to talk to you, but you got to open yourself up into that relationship. And prayer is a really important part of that. You also need to be present. Be present in worship. Be present in Bible study. Be present in Sunday school. Be present in ministry opportunities. One announcement I forgot to make, and I'm sorry, Randy. There's going to be a church cleanup coming up in May, on May 14th. An opportunity to come out, and if you like gardening, just to join with everybody else and be present together to make the church look beautiful. That's a way of being present, but at the same time, being present with other people. Too often we come and we sit in our own pew at church and we don't always necessarily interact as well as we could or come alongside of other people in the stuff that they're going through. Now, there are people that are just exceptional in that, that hear needs and everything else and go and respond right away, but what would it look like if we all did that? and came alongside of one another, that we were not just here, but that we were present fully. We would not only know the shepherd's voice, but we would know what the shepherd was guiding us to do in each of those situations. The other thing we need to do is we need to discover, we need to acknowledge, and we need to offer our gifts to God 
and his creation. What is it that God has granted you with, that's gifted you with, uh, in your life that you can offer back to God in amazing ways? One thing the senior high class was talking about in Sunday school this morning was people that do something just because it has to be done, or they feel a need because they feel like no one else will do it, or people that do it because they're giving back to God joyfully. They're, it's not about anybody else. It's about this is an opportunity I have to serve God and give back to them. If your serving isn't out of that, out of a joyful giving, out of a joyful sense that I get to give back to God and do something for God in the midst of the life of the church, of people, community, whatever, you're missing out. That's what we need to be doing. That's what it's about. It's that joyful giving. So we need to discover what is it that is our passion? What is it that's our gift? What is it that we can offer back to the church and everything else to make a difference that we can be joyful about doing it, that we can love doing it, that it gives us life and breath and everything else because that's what our shepherd wants for us. Serve God. And this is sort of tied together with our gifts. But serving God is getting down into the nitty-gritty hands and feet and doing what we can to be God's hands and feet in the world. There's an uh, old, I think it's more an urban myth, but it says at the end of World War II that they discovered there was a statue of Jesus and the hands and the feet got destroyed in a bombing raid and the Someone put a sign underneath that said that Christ has no other hands but yours, and Christ has no other feet but yours. Um, what if we thought of it that way, that when we share communion, that we become a part of the body of Christ, that Christ calls upon us to be those hands and feet in mission in the world? And finally, prayers, presence, gifts, service, witness. Witness to what God has done and is doing in your life. You are a part of the story. The Bible did not end at Revelation. It continues in each and every one of you. Each and every one of you is a new chapter in what God is doing in the world. Each and every one of us is a part of the Bible continuing to be written in this world and in God's creation. Each and every one of us is a part of that as long as we live into that, as long as we bear witness to what God is doing in our life and bear witness into what we see God doing in the world. People are looking for that. People are looking for that. It's an important part of who we are as disciples of Christ to train up other people, to raise up other people, to come alongside of them. I'm going to be sharing a little testimony at annual conference this year along with the, the conference youth about something that was instrumental in my own life. I have got my first start pretty much going to a Methodist church when I started dating Pam. And we attended Hereford United Methodist Church because that's the church that she grew up in. And the first time I came in the door, I met a gentleman with no legs sitting in a wheelchair who was the greeter for every single person that walked into that church. His name was Walter Mayo. And he greeted everyone with a smile that you couldn't, pay, you couldn't pay enough money for that kind of smile. He had a smile and a handshake that made you feel welcome and made you feel warm. And he knew who you were and he cared that you were there. And then there was another gentleman by the name of Bob Knott that would check in with me every week just to see how I was doing and how I was growing in my faith and everything else. Very instrumental in mentoring me, of coming alongside of a young guy, putting your arm around them, and just encouraging them in the walk of faith and showing and demonstrating in their own way what it looked like to be a Christian man. I learned from them. It inspired me. It encouraged me, and it nurtured me. I think one of the many reasons I'm in 
the, the field that I'm in, in ministry, and received a call from God is because of the nurturing that God was doing through each and every one of those. What would it look like if we chose to be that witness for someone else? What would it look like if you found someone that you could come alongside and begin to encourage to make sure that you seek them out every Sunday morning for worship or even during the week, send them a card or a phone call or get together with them and go for a walk or something like that, that you pick someone that you begin to come alongside of and encourage. What would it do for that person's life? I know what it's done for me. And I hope to find other people to be able to pass that along with as well. But to hear the shepherd's voice, we have to be in relationship with the shepherd so that we know that voice. And that voice calls us to do things like witnessing and mentoring and everything else that is life-giving. How many of you just listening to the story are already thinking, wow, that's incredible. Or maybe you're remembering someone that did that same thing for you. Or maybe you're thinking about, wow, I would love to be able to do that for someone else. It's the voice of the shepherd. That's the voice of the shepherd. Beloved, we have a shepherd that loves us. And as Ruby told the kids, doesn't matter what you think about it, it's going to love you anyway, right? <laughs> Whether you like it or not, God loves you. God loves you. And through you, God wants to love everyone else in the world. Through each and every one of us, we have the opportunity to be God's hands and feet and an expression of God's love in the world. All we have to know is the voice of the shepherd. And I've given you a map. Read your scripture. Pray. Be present. Offer your gifts. Offer your service. Offer your witness. And you will know God's voice speaking and calling and guiding you all along the way. Amen? Amen. Would you please rise and join us in our uh, hymn of sending, He Leadeth Me. It's hymn number 128.